welcome to all that are on. Um, I don't know what the numbers are showing, and my um, my antiquated system, the camera's not working, and the speakers aren't working, so I'm calling in by phone. But I've got, I can see the video when it comes up, and I've got uh, the agenda in front of me. So welcome to all of you to the NWSOFA Indivisible Climate Change Meeting. Uh, we're trying to do new things here with uh, work from remotes, and uh, it'll be interesting. So uh, let's see. You wanted wanted me to ask, at least on the agenda, if there was anyone new to the group beside the speakers, and if if they can uh, identify who they might be. No. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding. Well, or is that going to be problematic? <laughs> um, if, if that's our cue, well, we, we can start there. Uh, if, it, I'll, if that's our cue. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Mark Burroughs. I uh, was a locomotive engineer for 37 years at the Chicago Northwestern and the Canadian Pacific. Um, I'm a former co chair of Railroad Workers United which is a rank and file caucus of, lab, of activists in the rail unions uh, fighting to strengthen our unions to more effectively fight for safety and dignity. And, and, and uh, safety for us obviously impacts uh, the, the safety of the community is part of what we're going to discuss. I w served as a delegate in, at the 2011 and 2014 international conventions for the United Transportation Union, uh, Local 1433. And I'll let Jerry introduce herself. Hello, thank you all for joining us today. Um, please excuse if any of this equipment is running a little rough. Um, we tried very hard to get it working as best we could in the time we had. Um, I think it'll be okay. But um, if we have some bumps along the way, please forgive us. My name is Jerry Songer. I am the legislative director of the local 1211 uh, union, teachers union. Um, I'm not here in an official capacity, um, but uh, my, my union has supported this work and they've definitely supported Rail Workers United um, and their uh, quest for better working conditions. I originally got involved in this issue because I had in my own backyard the worst case scenario that is not the way you want to do politics, but um, I ended up with going from two to three trains a day uh, to over 20 in my entire house vibrating. So that is how I got involved in this issue. I've been working uh, and presenting with Sierra Club. Um, I've traveled the state doing the presentation that you're going to see tonight um, and working very hard to support our, our engineers, our, our railroad workers. So I'm going to put, Mark has a, a bit of an intro, I'll put him on and then I'll begin the presentation. If we're ready for that. I just wanted to uh, Mark, Mark uh, can I interrupt you a second there? I just want to do a couple of a uh, couple more uh, introductory things for NWSOFA to uh, if that's all right. Okay. Absolutely. I just was waiting yep. for my cues. Um, if if yep, I will do that. Um, if there are new people on listening here that don't know anything about NWSOFA and Indivisible, um, there's a sign up link online if you're in the in the meeting thing, or I can give it to you if you want to have it. Um, it's HTTP uh, colon backslash twice www.nwsofa.org slash contact hyphen US. Now that's long, but we can get it to you and maybe we could do that later. Um, OFA originally was Obama's organizing for America. After he became elected, a lot of people who were involved in the issues decided they wanted to keep issues going. So OFA reorganized and NWS is the Northwest suburban chapter of that. Uh, Sarah and Bill are the co-chapter leads. Uh, NWS OFA has many issue groups that are working on things. One of them is climate change and I'm the lead for that. 
Um, we have a gun violence prevention group. We have a stand with women group. We have a, a fiscal policy group. Um, uh, there are several others um, uh, that are working on good things. We have um, several coalition groups that are working with us, including Sierra Club, Citizens Climate Lobby, Palatine Cool Cities, Barrington Go Green, March for Science, Faith in Place, the Palatine Bike Club, League of Women Voters, um, St. James Earth Shepherds, Harper College, Oakton College, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, Citizens Utility Board. There are probably some others that I don't have off uh, on my list, but so there are people working on all kinds of things here. And um, I attended your uh, your presentation, Mark and Jerry, last fall, and I thought it was something that we should uh, link our groups to. Um, and so that's why we're having you here. And I hope somewhere down the road we can we can do this, uh, you know, on a live thing, maybe at the Palatine Library, or you know, another meeting venue after we get back to normal. Um, earlier today, Bill asked if I would connect a little bit of something of your presentation to to climate change. Um, I'm a retired environmental scientist. I worked with a company called Weston Solutions, and I was involved in several emergency response things like Katrina and and the BP oil spill and the pipeline spills in Michigan. I actually did uh, participate in oversight on one rail car um, uh, accident in Paulsboro, New Jersey, which leaked vinyl chloride. Anyway, um, climate change can be broadened into what I term all things environmental, and there are a lot of things that link to climate change. And um, so in our scenario tonight, working with the, with the railroad transportation of dangerous goods, it connects to all kinds of other science issues, and Jerry's discussion centers on dangerous goods transportation by rail. And her principal issue here is the explosive oil being transported by rail cars, but there's a lot of other nasty stuff in rail cars that we don't know about, but we probably should, um, often coming right through our neighborhoods and near schools. The climate part of this is also our continued use of fossil fuels, and what I hope comes from the meeting tonight for climate change is an awareness of some of these connections and possible legislative action and education. And um, I think, Jerry, you might want to comment on this um, because I think maybe you're partly responsible for getting our state senator, Ann Gillespie, to put uh, a um, legislation in the state Senate. And um, so with that, I will go back to you guys. Um, I'm going to go back to look at my agenda here. So, um, Sarah and Bill, do you have any other comments at this point? Yes, uh, if, if I could just uh, kind of jump in for a second here. Um, just kind of uh, setting some, some uh, rules of the road here for tonight. Um, and uh, I got over to a slide two here. Um, we want everyone to be as uh, respective as you can. We know the people who will come in and come out, so please mute all the TVs, radios, kids, dogs, and parakeets. Uh, if you're using two devices, uh, like a, a computer, a tablet, or a phone, make sure both are muted. Uh, when not speaking uh, on your phone, if you press star six on WebEx, it will mute you. Um, and for tonight's presentation, the uh, comments section, on WebEx, uh, it's uh, located on the lower right-hand side. It's a, it's a thought uh, icon. Uh, just go in there and type, type uh, a question, and then uh, when we're all done, uh, we can uh, have Mary and Mark uh, go through those. There also is a raise your hand symbol on WebEx that, that you can tap. Uh, we'll make a note of who is doing, who is uh, raising their hand, but we won't call you until later on. Um, in terms of uh, who we are, we're the Northwest Suburbs Organizing for Action. Uh, and we are in the Northwest Suburbs, six townships, uh, starting with Elk Grove and uh, um, 
Schaumburg going over to Des Plaines, uh, Wheeling, Barrington, and uh, uh, Wheeling, Barrington. I think I'm, I'm missing one of them there, but we cover uh, of those. And there's like basically 600,000 uh, folks in that area. Um, core purpose of NWS OFA is uh, to make sure that we have a more accessible and participatory democracy. Uh, and in our world, we do this by doing everything we can to make sure that there's one vote, one person. Um, our motto is to respect, empower, include, and organize. And we are organizers. We have nine different uh, teams and uh, they're constantly, like Mark on uh, climate change, they're organizing their groups, they're having meetings, now online meetings. We mobilize and we recruit people for actions. Um, this is our dual snowflake uh, chart. You can see all the two groups. Uh, climate change is represented by CC. Uh, we have a restore our democracy group. Gun violence prevention group, all on the line group, working with uh, uh, President Obama and Eric Holder on uh, gerrymandering. We have, of course, our Affordable Care Act for health uh, revisions, et cetera, our comprehensive immigration reform teams, uh, social outreach uh, for diversity, and uh, uh, our Stand With Women group that uh, had a lot of great successes over the last year, particularly the ERA in Illinois and across the, the country. And we have fiscal and economic group, and then we also have chapter events. Um, this is our communications group. Uh, um, what is interesting about the organization is we call it our secret sauce. Uh, it's our volunteer. And we have a group of 28 <laughs> volunteers that work uh, almost 50-50 between the issue teams and the communications teams. But it is a really a wonderful group. Uh, with that, uh, Mark, I'm going to let you... Uh, do the, uh, the introduction, and uh, then uh, we'll turn the computer over to uh, Jerry and uh, and Mark. Okay, so um, I, I, I have, uh, you know, the brief bios that we had uh, in the beginning of this, and I think Jerry uh, and, and Mark Burroughs, you've already uh, said uh, something about who you are and what you were doing. If you want to add to that, um, um, you could do that here at this point. From here on, I will. Uh, I will just. I'm going to go on the mute, and I'm going to watch the presentation. And um, Bill, unless you have anything else you want me to put in there, I would just say, take it away. <laughs> okay, Christine, can you give the presenter to uh, Jerry? Yeah, I'll let Jerry just that. take it. Okay, Jerry. Jerry and Mark, it's yours. Okay, I'll take that as the cue I've been waiting for. I, I, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Railroad Workers United. I'd like to thank all of you for this opportunity to have this discussion, as, as well as on behalf of Jerry and Michelle Burke, our technical advisor. We'll introduce her somewhere in the course of the evening. Uh, just a brief intro uh, to follow up. I feel we're here tonight to discuss the potential hazards posed to the children in our schools and by logical extension, the public, our communities, and the environment when the railroad industry fails to operate with maximum safety. Among other topics, we'll be highlighting examples of some of the worst case scenarios and the consequences when things go wrong um, because these incidents serve as a poster child for what can happen anytime, anywhere along freight railroad lines and the surrounding areas for quite some distance. Um, the most prominent example in the recent past is the incident in the town of Black Magentic, Quebec on July 6, 2013, where an out of control oil train derailed, exploded, leveling a portion of the downtown area and incinerating 47 people. The rail carriers, the Canadian government, and the United States government, which had a role in this tragedy, would have us believe 
that that was a one-time incident and the appropriate measures have been put in place so that that doesn't happen again. Move along, everything's fine, nothing to see here. We're here to present a different narrative that we feel merits your attention and concern that everything is not okay. And on that note, I'll turn it over to Jerry. Thank you. All right, so let me get my presentation up here and running. As Jerry does that, a reminder to everybody to go to the comments and make comments if you have questions that you'd like to have addressed later on or just want to make a general comment. Okay. Can you see? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yep. You're good? Yep. Okay. Please let me know if there's any sound issues as, as we go along here, okay? So um, we're going to be talking about uh, oil trains and hazardous materials near our schools. Um, not only do I, you know, I originally got involved in this issue because it is literally in my backyard, but being a teacher, my next horror was the fact that um, these trains are not only going through highly populated residential areas, they're also passing our schools. And as an educator, I feel a, a, a moral responsibility to make sure our children are safe. So um, that's what has originally got me motivated and why I have since 2014 not given up on this issue, nor will I, until either the trains are safe or I no longer am here. <laughs> um, I, this is a lifelong commitment for me. Um, so everything we're going to be going over today, are you able to see my cursor? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, if you write down this uh, website um, and you go to the about page, most of what I'm going to be talking about is in a presentation there. So I know there's some people that are not joining us uh, by video. Uh, there will be some video that you, I will be playing. And if at some point you would like to go over that or you know, go back over any of the information in this presentation, you can get the information here. Can I also add we are on Facebook Live for those who are on the phone under either Burke Labs or under Jerry's personal Facebook page, and we've also shared the link to the, face, the Facebook page for People Before Profits as well. So, I first want to call your attention. Can this be yeah. moved? Yeah. You can, you, you can. I want to call your attention to the, uh, the victims of the Lac Megantique tragedy. Yeah, we're not getting my mouse, so I'm not able to move some things around here. It's okay, I can yeah. All right, so um, this, this image shows 31 of the 47 people decimated in this disaster. Um, I, I especially would like to point out uh, the pictures of the, the mother and the two children. Uh, this particular family, uh, if you're familiar with Bruce Campbell, he did a lot of the policy making after this disaster in Lac Megantique, uh, he personally knows this family. So um, it seems like, okay, well, this happened somewhere else. It can't happen here. This is a very personal story um, and it directly impacts uh, some of the people I, I, I know and have a great deal of respect for. You could even see it from space Are we okay as with NASA Sumoy NPP satellite took this image of the glow of the fire. People jumped from the third floor of buildings in the central business district to escape the humongous fire. As the blazing oil flowed over to the ground, it entered the town's storm sewage system and emerged as huge fires towering from over storm sewer drains, manholes, and even chimneys and basements of buildings in the area. Around 150 firefighters were deployed to the scene, describing it as looking like a war zone. So you get a, a taste of, of 
the, hor the horror behind this incident. Um, when you see these trains pass, that's not always what comes to our imagination, but every time I see a train pass, this is, this is the image I have in my mind. Um, you know, two points I wanna make about this. Number one, it did not have to happen. Number two, we are fortunate because we have something that the victims of this tragedy did not have. Uh, we know, we have the knowledge. And now it's a question of what to do with that. Um, so the, the rail line near my home is the EJ and E, um, and it's Canadian National that runs past my home. So that was the first I started investigating. Uh, they have routes that run through Canada, America, Mexico. Um, this was once a publicly owned railway, and it is now a private, it is now considered private corporate property. So it was paid for with public tax dollars. It is now privately owned and, and, and PPPs or uh, private public or public private partnerships is, is another issue, kind of a, a, a side issue, but another very important issue that we need to keep in the back of our minds where, where our tax dollars are going and who's profiting from that and, and what our return on that investment is or, or is not. Uh, Canadian National must grant permission for public access to the tracks, uh, the maintenance records, safety records. So they own that information. It is not public, even though taxpayer dollars have paid for this railroad. Uh, these are some secondary routes, and this is only Canadian National. So you can see how in, you know, extensive of this, rail, this railway is. Um, a common carrier. Uh, provide services to the general public under license or authority provided by a regulatory body. This body can create, interpret, and enforce these regulations with independence and finality. A common carrier has to demonstrate that it is fit, willing, and able, and my argument is that they are not. Uh, common carriers typically transport people or goods according to defined and published routes, time schedules, and rate tables. So it's about getting the goods there. Safety is not the priority. Uh, the US government has exclusive regulatory authority, so that is our target. Yet there has been no government mandate made for regulation of industry safety standards. Well-financed uh, special interest groups represent, protect, and lobby for the interests of crude oil producers and refineries. Uh, the American Petroleum Institute's budget is around uh, 235 million a year, it could be more than that. Now, this is from 2016. Uh, the Association of American Railroads has a budget of 50 million to 60 million. So you can see they have a lot of money invested in making sure that the industry's um, interests are represented. Um, the they, the industry will argue that there's a government-backed need-to-know policy pertaining, pertaining, pertaining to rail transport of hazardous substances uh, under the guise of national security. Uh, they will argue that, but that is not, in fact, true. Uh, the United States uh, federal government decided that uh, its public does not need to know and therefore has obstructed public access. Um, again, this is what the rail companies are arguing. Um, but the public does not only need to know, it, ha it does have a right to know. And uh, the transport of hazardous substances via rail has threatened public safety, water sources, and the environment. So we need to be very vigilant in demanding information that we do have a right to have. Um, precision railroading. Um, as of 2011, Bill Gates was announced as the largest single shareholder of stock in Canadian National, which was a pub once, it was once, as I said, a publicly owned and financed railroad. Canadian National is the only rail company that has a direct route from oil rich Western Canada to the refinery rich Gulf Coast, which is north south. Um, their model of precision railroading. Uh, they run regularly scheduled trains that leave at predetermined times. Each car has a specific trip planned and fits the design of the schedule, which means they're focusing on what matters most to the customer, um, not the public. And um, one of the things that Mark had shared with me that, that 
shocked me was that um, every engineer knows that it's not a matter of if he gets fired, it's a matter of when, um, because they are held to the, the schedule, which is not always feasible. If they, uh, you know, they, if they try to press the speeds, it becomes dangerous to the public. If they don't, they could get fired. So that's the quandary that our, our, our engineers are faced with. Um, there are many other U.S. railways. Um, Warren Buffett is the billionaire investor who bought BNSF Railway in 2009. Um, it's become the nation's leading hauler of crude oil. They run east to west. Um, other dominant eastern railroads include uh, NS and CSX. Uh, the dominant western carriers are the BNSF and Union Pacific. Six of the seven largest rail carriers transport crude oil throughout the Chicago land area. Um, and currently, there are several major rail projects underway. The Amtrak Hiawatha proposal, which I have to say has been put to the side for now. Um, there ha that has been a major success in this area. Uh, they were arguing to put a holding track along the North Shore. Um, and Fortunately, they did get some representation from Senator Julie Morrison and uh, Congressman Brad Schneider. And for that at this point has been laid to rest. Canada is still pushing for it. I'm sorry, Wisconsin is still pushing for it. Um, so they're, they're staying vigilant in their fight. You know, they're not, they're not saying it's completely over, but for right now it, it, it has been laid to rest. There's also the CREATE program, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute and the Union Pacific Mes uh, Metro West Line. So the CREATE program. Um, here, I want you to really pay attention to how our public tax dollars are spent. And th this is where, you know, I want you to really start thinking about these private-public partnerships. Um, pay attention to how much the, the public uh, investment is compared to the private. So we've got 500 million from the state of Illinois, We've got 450 million from the federal government, 325 million from the rail industry, so that's your, your, your private investment. And then we have 30 million from the city of Chicago. Um, there's also another 80 million from the Chicago Region Environmental and Transportation Efficiency Program, that's the CREATE program, and 52 million um, from transportation and in investment. Um, generating, uh-oh, I lost my PowerPoint, sorry, getting it back, um, from the transportation investment generating economic recovery grant. So when you add it all up, we have 1.1 billion public tax dollars compared to a measly 325 million private dollars. So shouldn't that make us 71% shareholders in these rail lines? But we are not, we have to ask permission to even venture on their property. This is our return on investment. So an explosion resulting from the Bakken crude oil can decimate everything within a one mile radius blast zone. It comes with up to a three mile radius evacuation zone. Uh, railway infrastructure. Illinois is served by 47 common freight carrier railroads and 10 private freight carriers. There's 25 major junctions where trains headed, are headed in different directions on different railroads where they regularly meet. Additionally, there's 760 passenger trains that pass through the region each day. So I want you to think about the wear and tear on these railroad um, tracks. The volume of cargo transported via rail to, from, or through Chicago is forecast to increase nearly 150% between 2010 and 2040. Think about that, 150% more. I've already got 20 a day going past my home. Rail lines were built on more than a century, were, were, they were built more than a century ago in Chicago and they were not configured for the volume and type of freight that's currently being carried. 
So these these are our railways are not in the best condition, and I'm being very nice in saying that. Um, there are five corridors that exist that provide rail transport of cargo into, out of, and through Chicago. Uh, you can see those five here. There's the Central Beltway, Western Avenue, East West, and Passenger Express. I'm not going to go into this slide too much because as environmentalists, I know you know about fracking. Um, in 20, 2006, 4,700 train cars carried highly explosive crude oil. By 2013, more than 400,000 cars hauled crude oil. So that's an 8,500% increase. Most trains carry more than 3 million gallon, gallons of explosive crude in trains over one mile long. There is no legal limit to the length of a train. Uh, crude oil production. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with the North Dakota um, Bakken crude shale deposits. There's also deposits in Texas, Ohio, Nebraska, Colorado, and Kansas, which could eventually contribute to as much as 5 million barrels per day, according to the most optimistic forecasts. Uh, the Bakken field may well hold up, hold more than people think, and Ohio's Utica shale has barely been tapped. The deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico could give substantially more, perhaps 1 million to 2 million barrels a day on top of the 1.3 that's currently produced. What's increasingly evident is that shale gas is overwhelmingly abundant right here in the USA. In the last few years, we've discovered the equivalent of two Saudi Arabias of oil in the form of natural gas in the United States, not one, but two. So we have twice as much natural gas in this country, is that what you're saying, than they have oil in Saudi Arabia? I'm trying to very clearly say exactly that. So there's a lot of oil in this country and a lot of people who would like to get their hands on it. Um, just read this. So the oil business is booming. Um, one of the things I, I hope to impress on you is how quickly this has increased and how much more we're going to see. Um, Justin Mikulka has predicted a drastic increase in where we've been at over the last few years, which I'm going to show you has already been significant. So we have a graph, this goes from 1991 to 2015, and you can see that um, uh, export volumes reached a record of 354 bar barrels per day in 2018, uh, with a vast majority of oil going to refineries on the U.S., Gulf Coast, and Midwest. Uh, the Alberta government plans to put another 120,000 barrels per day on rails by this year. I should have corrected that, sorry. Um, so that's what we're seeing right now. So because if you're going to see an increase in transport, you're going to see an increase in rail in derailments. That it, that is just common sense. Um, and Makalka has proved true because already since January we've seen a significant increase in the, the derailments. So please pay attention to this um, picture. We've got if you're able to see it. Um, We've got the smallest line is 1,000 barrels a day. The largest is 800,000 barrels a day. So this is where we were in 2010. This is where we were in 2014. So you can see the drastic increase. This is even more shocking. Um, the red shows uh, train loading, the blue shows offloading. This is where we, we were at in 2010. Here we are in 2013. Uh, again, the rail is, or the red is loading, blue offloading, and now we have green, which is barge. I want that to sink in for a second. 
that, that this is just in three years, we've, we've gotten to this. Uh, one of the things that we're fighting with uh, is preemption. So uh, I've been involved in, as you said earlier, I've been involved in getting some legislation passed uh, here in the state of Illinois, but it, depending on what the legislation is at the state level, uh, you could be fighting it at the federal level. And I'm gonna go into that in a, a little later. But um, basically, as I said before, the federal government is going to have the final authority uh, over, over legislation. I'm getting some feedback here. Are you guys able to hear me? Would everybody please mute your phones or your computers? Thank you. Um, Oil by rail transloading companies are classified as non-carriers. And op this is where we have an opportunity to attack. <laughs> if we're gonna attack, this is the place. Just like I was talking about the along the North Shore and stopping the rail. Um, we have the, be the best way to defend ourselves is to stop things from coming before they get here. Um, and oil by rail transloading companies, they are non-carriers and the operations will not fall under the protection of federal preemption. So at the state level, this is a good place to fight. Uh, there are no pipelines to feed refineries on the West Coast, at least not yet. They want to get them through though. And they may be doing it right underneath our nose and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a few slides. Uh, so access to the Bach and crude in Canadian tar sands is only available by rail. Public, public opposition along with local and state support can block the development of transloading facilities, which slows rail service. Um, municipalities can pass an ordinance banning new oil infrastructure projects. So again, there is work that can be done at the local and state level. <clears throat> um, I think I'm gonna skip this. This is about the transloading and uh, stellar distribution, which is in Chicago. Uh, this is what these refineries look like where the oil is processed. This is one in Joliet along the Des Plaines uh, River. But I'm going to show you some that are even closer and could have recently been a catastrophic disaster, but we're not hearing about this in the news. Uh, this is what our refineries look like in 2015 to give you an idea. Um, most of the oil coming from Canada is being shipped to the Gulf Coast, so north and south. Um, most of the Bakken crude is going from uh, west to east. Uh, they, they like to be around water. The refineries use water in their processing. Um, I'm, I'll talk a little bit about the dot 111s. They are being phased out. Um, we're not seeing as many of them on the rails these days, but they do still exist. Um, they were recently involved in the um, derailment in Lake Forest. Those, these were the worst. They call them the Ford Pinto of rail cars. They were originally meant to haul corn syrup. Um, as early as 1991, the NTSB warned that the the cars were inadequate for flam flammable materials and were unable to withstand the forces of an accident. Um, right here is where I would like to put a, a little plug in for Justin McCulka's book, only because he does an excellent job, um, as does uh, Bruce Campbell in his book, um, talking about regulatory capture is, is the, the term that they're, they're calling this. Uh, you would think the NTSB would be able to say, okay, this is not safe. But, you know, so let's change the regulations, but they are unable to do so. And they do a great job. I, I can't even begin to uh, explain that fast, you know, that facet of this issue um, like, like they can. Um, we do have upgrades. We've got the uh, CPC 1232. And now we have, what is the last one called? Uh, my memory is failing me. The DOT 116s or the other 
the one seventeens. Yeah, we have the one seventeens and the retrofit, uh, retrofitted one seventeens. It was the one seventeens that were involved in the Chicago derailment. East Chicago. East Chicago. East yeah. Chicago derailment. Um, yes, and I've got it right here. I should have turned the slide. Um, the the dot um, one seventeens have also derailed and uh, were punctured. Um, the dot one seventeens are are not the same as pressure cards that are used to move hazardous materials such as liquid propane. So, the, you know, they're still even though they're shipping something with a, a one mile radius blast zone, um, and now they're going to be used to ship on liquefied natural gas, which is even worse. Um, they're still not as um, protected as uh, pressure cars. So that is another thing we should be asking for. Um, in June 2018, the first train consisting of the uh, 117 retrofitted cars derailed in Iowa. Uh, 32 cars left the tracks and 14 punctured, resulting in an oil spill of 230,000 gallons into a flooded river. Um, they don't appear to offer any substantial benefits over earlier models um, for surviving derailments intact. Tank cars are, are tested at 14 to 15 miles per hour, but the average derailment speed for heavy freight trains is 24 miles per hour. Uh, currently, hazardous um, hazmat tankers can go as fast as 40 miles per hour is what we have. Um, 50 outside of high urban threat areas. 50 miles outside of high urban threat areas, 40 miles in densely populated areas. Um, but again, as I said, they the, the average derailment speed is 24 miles per hour. So we should be fighting for speed limits. Um, regulators say that they'll consider lowering it to 30, have not done that. In fact, they've raised it in some areas. Uh, speeds in excess of 25 five miles per hour are considered irresponsible given the known weaknesses of tank cars. Um, current air braking systems used in oil and ethanol trains are based on technology developed in the 1860s, the Civil War era. Oil and rail industries say it could cost 20 billion, 21 billion to develop and install brakes, and they claim minim, minimal benefits. Um, the benefit is still debated. Um, the engineers are claiming that they're still, even, even the best brakes are still causing problems. Um, the ECP brakes, which are the electronically controlled pneumatic braking systems, um, the, there was legislation um, mandating them, but that was repealed it by the Trump administration. So uh, the engineers recently got something saying that they are no longer a requirement for uh, hazardous uh, trains carrying hazardous materials. The FAST Act tr transportation bill, it was a 1300 page bill. Um, it was crammed through Congress um, it was 305, uh, it's a $305 billion bill that extends federal transportation funding for five years, uh, streamlining the Federal Railroad Rehabilitation Loan Program um, by providing low interest loans. Um, again, we're seeing many of our tax dollars here being used for upgrades to uh, private industry, such as rebuilding bridges uh, and purchasing new locomotives. Um, right after this was passed, that's when I started seeing the, uh, the upgraded trains uh, rolling past my home. So really what this appeared to me to do was buy a new fleet for the rail industry. Um, keep in mind that they're making more profits these days than ever, but they're not investing much of those profits back into their industry. We are. Uh, another area that we should be looking for legislation uh, to, to help make things safer. Again, I don't ever want to confuse that with safe. This will never be safe, um, but we can for the time being make it 
safer. Um, the read vapor pressure of gasoline can range from 7 to 15 uh, PSI. Um, it's explosive, which is why pressure cars are needed for transport. Oil in samples from Lockmeek Antique tank cars range from 9 to 9.6 PSI. Uh, oil involved in the massive oil train fire and explosion in Mount Carbon, West Virginia, had a RVP of 19.9 PSI. Uh, samples from Lynchburg were over 14, and Bach and Crude falls to the same uh, RVP range as gasoline, but pressure cars are not required. That's why. Some regulators argue that stabilization, or you might also hear the term degasification, could make uh, Bach and Crude safer. Um, the industry argues that there are no studies to support its effectiveness, but again, uh, it would lower sales by a reported 2%, so they have an interest in saying it's not effective. Um, Canadian National is well documented. Um, we can't trust the industry to tell us the truth. Um, they're known for um, minimizing, not disclosing, and outright lying. Uh, when I found out about the you know, what the trains pass in passing my neighborhood were carrying. Uh, there had been a, a derailment in Mundelein, which is right down the tracks from me. I had a concern that there could, you know, we depend, my, my community depends on well water. Um, so my, you know, one of the, my first horrors was, um, could there have been a spill that was not reported? Uh, I called the, the county uh, I count. I called the EPA, both the Illinois and the U.S. All three gave me the same story. They refused to investigate a spill unless Canadian National reported a spill. So the very industry that would not want anybody to know about a spill has to be the one to say, come investigate me. That to me was the wrong answer. Um, the derailment in Lac Antique killed over 47 unsuspecting people. It burned for three days. In Cherry Valley, Illinois, an explosion and fire killed a passenger in a car. Um, you don't just have to be living near a rail line or working near a air, air, rail line or going to school near one. Uh, you could just simply be stopped at a rail grade crossing. That's what happened to um, Zwila Taliz. Um, she and her daughter, her pregnant granddaughter, were stopped at the rail grade crossing. They were unable to escape the fireball as they tried to run from the burning train. Um, neither Zoila or her unborn grandchild survived that that explosion. Um, emergency preparedness. This is another thing we need to be fighting for. Uh, there's not a fire department in the area equipped to put out a f the inferno caused by the atomic bomb-sized exploding oil train. Most police and firefighters have not received trading, um, or if they have, uh, it's questionable as to whether or not it's enough or, or even good training. Um, of those trained, the content of workshops provided may not be adequate. Um, they don't always include field experience. Um, Mosier, Oregon Fire Chief Jim Appleton argued that the special uh, firefighting foam touted as being designed to specifically put out oil fires does not work. The problem is, what he said was, the oil trains, uh, the tankers uh, produce so much heat that the foam just um, disintegrates before it can suppress the fire. So he said one of the keys uh, to being able to attack a, a, a fiery derailment is access to water. Uh, again, my, my community is not alone in not even having fire hydrants. Um, there's also deregula uh, deregulate, deregulation. <laughs> The Staggers Act of 1980 deregulated the American railroad industry. The current rail industry uh, norm is for freight trains to carry a two-person crew, um, an engineer operating the train and a conductor handling various other tasks. 
Uh, at times, the rail industry has circumvented this standard. And that's what ended up happening uh, to the derailment in Canada. Um, at times, I'm sorry, uh, engineers are required also to work long hours and they're expected to manage technology, which one engineer in public comment compared to playing three video games at one time. Again, with not much sleep. Trains are legally allowed to be left unintended and idling. <laughs> um, this, again, this is what led to the Lac Megantique disaster. Um, as long as the railroad has a, a procedure plan on file, there's no legal limit to the length of freight trains. Uh, derailment suggests that 70 to 74 cars per train may be safer. Uh, most oil trains carry more than 3 million gallons of explosive crude, and only individual trains carrying more than 1 million gallons of crude or more need to be reported to state emergency officials. Uh, the information is not guaranteed to reach local communities. Get up or down. I'm getting somebody talking in here. Um, so the, the information now, they have passed legislation to get the information from the um, industry to the municipalities, um, but that's as far as it goes. The public still does not have access to the information as to what's being carried, uh, when it's being carried, but really, if you look on any rail line, uh, you're going to see this being carried uh, quite frequently. Um, FEMSA uh, 2014, uh, they, the US Transportation Department recently issued final rules. So this is what, this is the legislation that, find, that mandated that we get at least the information to the municipalities. Um, the railroads need to establish geographic response zones. So we're, we're at least beginning to see a, a little better emergency preparedness, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. Um, the compliance with these amendments were required as of last August uh, 27, 2019. Um, this is some of the current legislation. Um, Senator Terry Link introduced uh, and passed um, Senate Bill 24. So in Illinois, we do have a mandate that at least two individuals must uh, be operating a, uh, a freight train. But again, there's the issue that could be fought uh, in the courts, uh, you know, the issue of preemption. Um, so, uh, Senator, or I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Brad Schneider uh, co-sponsored U.S. House Resolution uh, uh, 5553. Um, that is, and um, there's also a uh, U.S. Senate Bill um, 1979. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. We've got uh, U.S. House Resolution 1748 and U.S. Senate Bill 1979. Those are both, um, you know, the House and, and uh, Senate versions of the Safe Freight Act. So both of those bills are currently in committee. They can sit in committee quite some time. They may never come out. Um, we should be contacting our uh, elected officials to get those bills moving. Um, then um, recently there was the Crude by Rail Volatility Standards Act. So I told you a little bit about the vapor pressure. This would um, mandate that um, it, pro it prohibits the transportation of rail um, of crude the train by rail of crude oil with a read vapor pressure of more than 9.5 pounds per square inch. There is no accountability. It's the oil producers and refineries that own the rail cards, not the railroads. And it's the railroad's responsibility to regulate its own infrastructure, which means the railway and bridges. A review of 31 crashes on oil trains since 2013 puts track failure at the heart of the growing uh, safety problem. And track problems were blamed in 59% of crashes, more than double the overall rate uh, for freight train accidents. 
Um, if you can see the, the picture, this was in Chicago. This is actually where I met um, uh, Mark. Uh, I was on a tour and looking at some of the, the rail infrastructure and the bridges are rotted and unsafe. Many are. There's over, uh, there's 70,000 to 100,000 such bridges in the US with no regulation. Uh, the oil trains cause unusual track damage. They impart higher than usual forces to track infrastructure. Just three inches of movement between, between rails or wheels lifted one half inch can cause a derailment. Even if tracks conform to federal standards, they can separate under the heavy force of a train. Uh, wide gauge, which is the space between rails, is the single largest cause of accidents involving track defects. Uh, private railroad experts, um, uh, there's a sloshing effect, uh, which that is what can widen the gauge of the railway. Um, they are also, they are considered the primary factor contributing to track defects, especially those caused by slower speeds. So you don't want to go too fast, you don't want to go too slow. But again, this is another pressure on the backs of our engineers. Um, sloshing also increases the severity of an accident and the risk of a tank rollover. Crude oil is heavier than ethanol and weight limits can be met before the tank car is full, creating more headspace and increased sloshing. So even though there are weight limits, the oil in, or the rail industry will push that because they want these tankers full. So you're either going to have the problem of the slashing or you're going to have the weight. Um, you know, both are bad. I think I'm going to skip over this one and kind of move around. There's an issue with cross ties. Um, many can be defective and they're allowed to be. Um, Hydrogen sulfide. So, Bakken crude oil, um, they use chemicals when fracking, and these chemicals stay in the oil. Um, hydrogen sulfide was the, found to be um, in Bakken crude oil. The US law pro prohibits exposure to more than 50 parts of hydrogen sulfide. Anything above that triggers shock, convulsions, and coma pushed beyond 700 ppm, and death is likely within two breaths. Enbridge discovered crude with 1,200 parts per million of the gas, almost twice as much as what it takes to kill you. Uh, exposure to hydrogen sulfide, no matter how seemingly insignificant, can lead to internal organ failure, infertility, immune system suppression, blood disorders, cancer, birth defects, and genetic mutations. And this is what we have going right next to our children. What's the EPA on fire uh, and ambulance? 1222 Eppingham, 10 for Kinman, the Alma Fire Department, if I EPA, five minutes, ambulance, five to seven minutes. 2224, advise ambulance and EMS to expedite. I'll be on the car checking back. <laughs> So what I want you to pay attention to is how quickly it takes for somebody to die. This is ammonia. <laughs> and he is no longer breathing. So there is some argument as to whether this is a real video or whether this is a um, training video. But I left it in this presentation because either way, it shows you what I want you to see. And that's how quickly our children could die if they're exposed to this. Yeah, it looks like smoke. A teacher could bring a, a, a child outside of a school building and try to get them to what they consider a safe area 
And if they bring those children through something that looks like smoke, they're not going to last very long. This one is upsetting to me. This, this, we, we need, this needs to stop. Put the EDA on. Good evening. In a little more than this 48 hours, there gas. have been three railroad tank car accidents in southeastern United States. Before dawn this morning, another derailment in Youngstown, Florida, punctured a tank car, sending chlorine gas into the air and killing at least eight people. More than 60 people are in the hospital, some of them in critical condition. Kenley Jones reports from Florida. The train which derailed this time was a southbound freight of the Atlanta and St. Andrews Bay Railroad a small line which operates between Dothan, Alabama and Panama City, Florida. A tank car carrying poisonous chlorine gas was ruptured in the wreck. A deadly missile oh, gas was from the tank car. Motorists who were driving at night alongside the tracks were caught by surprise. Most of the victims who died were found in their cars along U.S. Highway 231. People killed by poison gas like they were on a battlefield in World War I or something instead of just driving their cars along U.S. Highway. So again, they, they didn't even have time to get out of their cars. This is how quickly they can die. Um, in Youngstown, Florida, uh, ultimately uh, in that derailment, there were eight fatalities, 118 people in the hospital, some critically injured, 2,500 residents evacuated. Most victims who died were found in their cars along the U.S. Highway. Uh, there are for what they call oil train secrets, this is information that the oil industries, the rail industries do not want us to know. They don't want us to know their routing choices. They don't want us to know our, their worst case scenario models. They don't want to know um, the insurance amount that they have to cover themselves. Many times they don't have any. Sometimes it's we taxpayers that are paying for the insurance, which I believe is wrong. And I'm going to talk a little bit about insurance in a little bit. Um, and they don't want us to know their emergency response plans when the unthinkable happens. Um, Forest Ethics has called now called Stand has dubbed these the oil train secrets and is calling for their public release. Um, if you're able to take a picture. If not, um, these are some uh, apps that you can get to try to determine what you have going past either your home or your place of work if you want to do a little research. Um, this is actually my home. You can see how close I am to the rail lines. Um, they're carrying hazardous substances within yards of residential communities. Uh, CN trains transport hazardous substances within yards of playgrounds, schools, and other public locations. Um, this is another picture that is very upsetting to me. You can see the trailer park. Um, you know, in Lake Forest, in other places, they fight for a 20-foot retaining wall. Um, not that that would do any good, but you can see they certainly don't have one. Um, again, it's a trailer park. And even more infuriating, those children, if they're to go play on the playground on the opposite side of the tracks, will need to cross the tracks to get there. Again, if there was a derailment there, this would be decimated. This is uh, Townline Elementary, Hawthorne Elementary, and Middle Schools North. Again, you can see, the, um, if you're able to see, the, uh, the proximity of these elementary schools to the, trail, uh, the rail lines. Uh, Aspen Elementary School. Like Zurich High School, this is where my grandchildren, this is where they will attend unless I can talk some sense into my daughter, and get them moved. Uh, St. Matthew's Lutheran School, Hawthorne Woods Aquatic Center, Wicklow East Park, Twin Rinks Ice Pavilion. I'm just trying to give you an idea. And this is what they're in danger of. This is a, uh, West Virginia, a train carrying more than 100 tankers of crude oil. Those, those pictures of schools would not make it in this kind of a, a derailment and fire. Um, so what are the odds of this happening near us? Six have already happened in our Lake County area. Um, we've had one, I'm sorry, two in Buffalo Grove near the ice rink. 
We've had uh, one, two in Northbrook at the same location where a bridge collapsed, killing two people um, the second time it collapsed because they didn't fix it right the first time. Those two people, uh, a couple, they were not discovered until the next day um, when they were cleaning up. Um, there was another one in Mundelein and the last one in Lake Forest. Um, neither the Buffalo Grove or the Mundelein incident has a report filed with the, F, uh, the FRA or the NSTB and TSB, which makes it difficult possible to really get an idea of how many actual derailments there have been. Um, as I said before, uh, Justin McCulka forecasts more. Uh, he, it, we should expect to see more accidents. Um, Senate resolution, this is the one that I recently fought for. Um, it was a, a resolution that I wrote um, and brought to Senator Julie Morrison. Um, I testified to the uh, Illinois Senate Education Committee uh, there, and there was a unanimous vote to move it to the floor. And the very next day it was adopted. So. What this will do is um, include school personnel and emergency response plans specific to hazardous materials, the storage and transport of hazardous materials. But it is a resolution. I, we still need a bill. Um, the latest derailment was in East Chicago. I'm going to let um, um, Shelly talk a little bit about that because she actually went and investigated this, this derailment. Um, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the quick um, news report because I want you to compare the news report to what you're actually going to hear about that derailment. Pentagon investigates yesterday's train derailment in nearby East Chicago, Indiana. Newly designed tank cars may have limited the damage. We've reported on crude oil train incidents in the past in which fireballs shot to the sky or the product leaks. But that's not what happens. From the looks of it, this train Wednesday's to be The train was transported to fire in place. Nothing leaked. Transporting at maximum speed, that's allowable here, and you had the first derail, and the product was contained. If this happened several years ago, could it have been a different outcome? These are newer and stronger tank cars, and they're now required by the federal government. They have uh, several levels of protection, uh, thermal protection, all these things. So, you know, even uh, we can see some stuff like little well, deaths, things like that, but, you know, all the product was contained. The cause of the derailment last night is under investigation. Meanwhile, the Federal Railroad Administration says older modern tank cars are being steadily phased out. So, what you're hearing from this news report is what sounds to me like an infomercial for newer, stronger, safer rail cars. Um, they didn't puncture, no product leaked, we're, we're good. But I'm gonna have you take a look at the reality of what that derailment was. Hey everybody. So in East Chicago, back at the end of February, literally the day or so after, or within a day of when her resolution passed, we had this derailment in East Chicago, right next to a K, K to eight school. If that had happened during school hours, which it didn't, it could have been a lot worse. Um, Originally, it was initially reported as five to 10 cars. Um, I found out the next morning that it was 18 cars. 12 of them landed on their sides. None of them got punctured be, like, to leak, but they did have to empty out those cars before they were able to move them. So this is looking at where the derailment happened. So you can see the school kind of in the center of the screen and on the bottom. There's Euclid Avenue, Chicago Avenue is just south of the school. 
this is over in East Chicago, just in case people are um, just joining us. The, and the derailment happened just west of the school. And within, if you scroll, if you like zoom out on the picture, you got East uh, Gary Chicago International Airport just to the east. You've got a rail yard, you can see there's a rail yard right up at the top left, that's Indiana Harbor. It had us blocked for the better part of a full day or more. And here's here's a more kind of a bigger a zoomed out picture of where this happened. And you can see the oil facilities, the storage facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a it was right next to the storage facility there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to kind of wrap this up. There is more um, and you can see that on the website. Um, more about side issues of pipeline and um, the storage of the of the hazardous materials and um, the fracking that's going on in the um, uh, Gulf Coast, which is concerning. Um, you want to turn it over to? Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it over to Mark. OK, thank you, Jerry and Michelle. I'm going to try to get through real quickly. Um, as far as uh, Lac Magentic, um, uh, Bruce Campbell wrote a book that pretty much says it all, Black Magentic Rail Disaster, Public Betrayal, Justice Denied. I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, believe me, between our research and defending the coworker who was being scapegoated and Bruce's research in the book, um, clearly profit-driven, corner-cutting, and and if, if if we had the opportunity to put the the corporate bosses on trial, we could gain a conviction for corporate manslaughter. Um, I'm glad that Jerry brought up the issue of the ammonia cars because even if oil all the oil was left in the ground tomorrow, uh, uh, an ammonia car could open up in a heavily populated area or chlorine. This stuff is instant death. And in a heavily populated area, the casualties could be massive. Um, Railroad Workers United, and I invite you to go to our website, railroadworkersunited.org. We have a special section right up on the front of the homepage. We're calling 2019 the year of the derailment. There were 48 derailments in 2019 alone. Um, some of them were, were, were quite spectacular. Two, two that really stand out and, and including, there was one in uh, September in Southern Alberta where 23 rail cars leaking octane had a two kil kilometer evacuation and it could have been worse as the train, this is quoting the locals, that it could have been worse as the train was carrying uh, ammonia. and. Outside of in Saskatchewan, a, a town called Guernsey, within a within a period of a few weeks, there were two derailments. That one 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 derailment uh, leaked out 1.5 million liters of diluted bitumen, and another derailment leaked out 1.2 million liters. Why are these derailments happening? Are the workers just reckless, irresponsible? Uh, the main safety issues that we face, long and heavy trains. When I started out 5,000 feet, a mile long train, that was a challenge. Um, nowadays, they're 20,000 feet, 20,000 tons. They taught us about the laws of physics and, 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 and teaching us how to uh, handle these. So they know firsthand the, 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 the laws of physics that, that they're challenging. Fatigue. Many rail workers work on 24 hour call, go to work on two hours notice. 12 hour, 12 hour plus days are the norm. Um, 12, hour days, 12 hour days are the norm. Uh, so you've got fatigue, we can't lay off. Uh, you're, many, many railroads have a one day a month policy, so people are coming in fatigued, exhausted. Deferred maintenance of the rolling stock and the infrastructure. Jerry touched upon this with the track issues. Uh, there, 
it is possible to inspect the rails. It is possible to maintain the rails. Cutbacks, everybody's being cut back. Uh, and there, there's less track inspections and that, that, that is a very contributing factor to why these, uh, all these track related uh, uh, derailments are happening. Carmen who inspect the freight cars to, to make sure that the, that, that the wheels roll freely. If they don't roll freely, they lock up and, and, and eventually they get the, the, the heat, they just disintegrate. Many derailments are caused by that. They, they inspect the braking mechanism. Uh, and, and so as carmen are cut, the rolling stock is not being properly inspected. And for the sake of time, I think I'll just, uh, uh, for the sake of time, I think I'll just leave it there and, and perhaps more can be covered or addressed in question and answered. But uh, um, again, I encourage you to go to our website. We have a wealth of information and thank you very much for having, for ha having this discussion. So, um, do we want to open for Q and A? So most everyone's unmuted. So <clears throat> the floor is open. Yeah, this is Jim McGrath. I, I have two questions. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you, Jim. Okay, thanks. Um, so I live in Barrington. The CN goes through probably 20 times a day with all kinds of tank cars. Um, so two, two questions. First one is this product has to be transported somehow and people are protesting pipelines. Which are better? Pipelines or, or tank cars? Well, you know, in, in the rest of the PowerPoint, I didn't want to bring that in because this, I've already thrown so much at you. Uh, there's no good answer. Pipeline is not good either. Um, what I'm advocating for is, is a budgeted long-term phase out. Um, we, we need to keep in mind, you know, our railroad workers, they, the oil boom has been good for them because it's been business. Um, we need to make sure that there is some plan in place as we start addressing this issue. Um, uh, but I, I don't want to use that term. I, you know it wants to come out of my mouth, and I know I'm talking to environmentalists. But um, we, I'm advocating for a long-term phase-out plan. There's, there's no good way. Pipeline, I don't believe, is better than rail. I think they're both bad. I'd like to just briefly answer and, and, and introduce Fritz. Um, Fritz, Fritz Edler is a, um, a member of Railroad Workers United and he's with us uh, in some way, shape or form. And uh, um, I would like to uh, just real briefly to answer that. The question is safety, whether, whether it's railroad, whether it's pipeline, it, it, whatever it is, it has to be done safely. And, 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 and I think part of what, what this whole discussion exposes is the lack of democracy. We need to be able to democratically decide. We need, as a society, we need to be able to democratically answer that question based upon the science. And whatever the answer that, that we democratically arrive at, we need to mandate that whether it be pipeline or train, that it be done safely. And, 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 and I just wanted to, I, I wanted to double, I, I forgot to mention the uh, single employee crew issue uh, in my haste to finish up in my time limit, which fortunately Jerry covered. Uh, but that, that's the best answer I can give to that question for now. Okay, fair answer. Uh, second question, I, I, as I mentioned, I, I live in a town where the CNN, CN goes through, I don't know how many times a day. And you also have UP in there too. Yeah, have, have, um, has this presentation been shown to the municipalities along the line? Because this is uh, I mean, a scary, a scary thought. 
they have this stuff going through, and it goes by schools, it goes through by homes in, in Burlington. Uh, we would certainly like to. Uh, we we and anywhere where 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 Jerry and I can get an audience, uh, we 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 feel this is important information that the public needs to know. So that I mean, knowledge is power. It's a cliche, but but this is about empowering us uh, a, as part of strengthening our democracy. So. Uh, we're open for suggestions. We appreciate the invite, and, and, and trust me, wherever we get an invitation, we'll be there. Okay, I just need your contact information. All right, we'll, we'll okay, make you yeah, we'll sure get it from that. Mark. And I also want to point out uh, Fritz Edler, he was involved in um, trying to pr help protect the engineers that were accused in the Lac Migantique incident. Fritz, do you want to comment on that? Fritz, you got to pull yourself off of mute, buddy. Yeah, right. Uh, can, it, can you all hear me? Uh, this is Fritz Edler, um, and uh, I was chair of the International Defense Committee for uh, Tom Harding and Richard Labrie, railroad workers who were uh, scapegoated for the Lac Migantic incident. And um, uh, I guess the most important thing that, well, we want to make a point as railroad workers about this question is, is that even though that so much, you know, so much of this wonderful presentation you've had tonight, um, uh, I don't know what you're can, uh, you need to do something. I can't, uh, I see pointing, but I don't see, uh, does any, nod your head if you can hear me. We can hear you, Fritz. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, had a few little technical difficulties, but what a wonderful presentation. The important thing is that we learned a tremendous amount out of the Lac Megantic wreck and about, even though we didn't want to have a trial, the trial revealed tremendous things that uh, now arm us with the things that we need to be able to do things more safely. But the important thing is that rail, the railroad network is key to uh, not just the question of how we can safely do our energy, but also to the question of climate change, which is the central interest of the group that uh, is hosting this particular conversation. The question is, are we going to do what we have to do in order to be able to make the railroad networks serve their original purpose instead of becoming a fossil fuel export machine? The fossil fuel export machine that the, that the continent's railroad networks are now in danger of becoming actually crowd all the other kinds of things we need and it's the future-proof railroad network in such a way that it'll serve us into the green transportation future. Um, and I could speak more to the Lac Megantic trial, but I really think, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the presentation was excellent, and uh, I'd like to see what some of the other kinds of questions people have. I was getting ready to put a comment in about the pipeline question, and I absolutely agree that neither pipelines nor crude by rail are the thing that we want to be doing. But I will say this, using pipelines for the carrying of these kinds of products requires an, the creation of an entirely new infrastructure that has to be capitalized and built. And once it is built, it can serve no other purpose. The only purpose it can serve moving the crude oil and uh, uh, those kinds of products, and then that will have to be justified. But we can do other things with rail. Any other questions? Jerry, I, I have a comment. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned two derailments in Buffalo Grove near the uh, ice skating rink. Yes. It's about a mile and a half right along uh, Lake Cook Road east of me. Uh, for whatever reason, that was news to me. 
I yeah. really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we've had six and, and people forget it because the media doesn't make a big deal. I mean, look at the one in East Chicago. That could have been because of the location right near those storage tanks. That could have blown. I mean, if one derailment of just oil tankers in Lac Megantique, Quebec, Canada took out most of a village, what would it look like to have one of those storage tank fields blow up? And you don't hear about that. You don't hear about any of that in the news. I, I, Maggie, I do remember the news coverage around the Buffalo Grove one where the couple was killed. Um, was and I, yeah. Yeah, and I remember it, the stories being about crumbling infrastructure, the hazards of, you know, having a explosive materials and the trains being um, ignited and something like that it wasn't even part of the coverage. It was all just about crumbling bridges. Yeah, and the reason the bridges are crumbling is because the oil or the rail industry is left to regulate its own infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, even after the first time, that second time never should have happened. I mean, considering there had been a first one almost a year to the date earlier. Yes. They should have had that fixed after, I mean, at least in that first derailment, nobody died. In the second one, there was a couple that died and Lord only knows if they were in that rubble suffering until they were found the next day and they had by that time were deceased. But this is horrific what is going on. And it's like, we, you know, when I was first trying to uncover this, nobody knew. I went from house to house in my neighborhood, um, letting people know, asking them if they knew and letting them know if they didn't, which was every single case down the street throughout my neighborhood. I talked to, I work in a school district, one of the largest in the state of Illinois. Nobody there knew, including my superintendent. Nobody knew what was going on. Most of the information I got was from uh, Canada at the time. Uh, there was one uh, forest ethics, which is now stand. Uh, they are on the West Coast. And then a lot of what I learned was from Justin Mikulka and D. Smog on the East Coast. But people do not know. Most of the information we get in the States is from local news media uh, sources. So, you know, we heard about this recent East Chicago derailment. Did they hear about it on the West Coast? Did it make national news? I doubt it. Except for through the Railroad Workers United page. Yes. Please join Rail Workers United. Um, and in fact, if you go to um, people hyphen B, the number four hyphen profits um, dot org, there's also a link where you can subscribe to a um, Railroad Workers United um, uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. And you know, something else that I find very troublesome is it, it seems like almost monthly you get a report of a rail worker that has died. Sometimes more than one. That 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 is inexcusable. Mark Lundholm here. If I could make a couple of uh, quick comments and questions, um, I'm just curious if uh, for the railroad workers, are they given uh, OSHA 40-hour hazard, hazardous materials training since that's what they're transporting? Um, as an environmental worker, you could not get on sites unless you had those things and refreshers every year so and and probably the local fire departments and police ought to have those things too what so when you get a derailment and you know the hazard placards on the car you know whether or not to get in there or you know, you know where to stay away or maybe try to find some what we hear about is ppe these days but i don't think there's any ppe for anhydrous ammonia or you know uh, uh, you know, some of these other things like vinyl chloride, they volatilize and you'll be dead quickly. You'll have scarred lungs. But anyway, the railroad workers, do they get any safety training like that? And why not? I would say the answer to that is no. Um, engineers get recertified uh, our, our federal licenses. Uh, we've been federal licensed since the 90s and now conductors are, are under that same 
um, federal licensing. And so we, we get recertified every three years, um, have a little crash course on, on uh, track training dynamics and rules and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it, it's part of our job description that our responsibility to know what's in our train, know where it's at. But, um, but in answer to your question, we don't get any real special training. And, and um, yeah, no, no, we, 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 we don't get any, a, a, anything special. And just on your, the, the, you, you talk about PPE, they'll, they'll, they'll fire you if you're not wearing your safe glasses or your earplugs. Uh, my last year before I retired, I was I, I was so fearful of not making it out because it, it, sometimes the Bensonville yard can be like the Wild West with just uh, uh, um, uh, so much derailments and metal on metal. I was shopping around looking for some industrial type mask that that in case something happened that I might be able to get out alive. But um, uh, uh, it'd be nice if they issued it, but no. So one other uh, quick rail question, um, and are, are we uh, shipping uh, pressurized uh, liquid natural gas in tank cars yet, or, and how much? We are. Not a lot yet, but I believe um, he signed it at the end of last year, so I do believe it is in effect by now. If it isn't, it, it will take effect shortly. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh-huh. You, you can't, okay. This is my first time on this application, so I've been sort of muddling through it. And this Thank is you Joseph. for joining us. Yeah, and this is Joe Salvador. I had a question on the training. And first of all, I do agree we've got to cut, cut down on fossil fuel consumption. Safety is important. But have you contacted or connected with any, any hazmat people in private industry? in terms of a training a training people even in the public sector or training people uh the railroad people and and the reason i ask that question i've been retired for about 10 years but i worked for a company we hauled a lot of stuff including anhydrous ammonia but we had a very good hazmat team and i think they went out and actually trained people uh, in the public sector it seems like that would be a very good connection in terms of training. So have, have you connected to anybody? The best answer I can give to that is, is we're trying to rally our coworkers that we need to take this fight into our unions to demand a safe working environment. Uh, um, uh, we, we don't, as far as training to 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 clean up and deal with the disaster after it's happened we are adamant about trying to prevent these disasters and so that's our focus and 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 try try trying to to uh uh, uh galvanize our co-workers to wage this fight as, as well as to galvanize the community because it after Lock Magentic, everybody realizes that that the public has a stake in this fight for for a safe railroading operation. So that's the best answer I can give to that right now. Well, and I've talked to, um, this kind of jumps ahead to our ask, but um, one of the things that uh, Jim Appleton, the fire chief in Mosier, Oregon, uh, is he is a proponent of uh, incident command centers um, where you bring in multiple, um, I don't know, facets of, of a response to where there is one central location that is connecting everybody in a potential emergency. So that, you know, all of this has been worked through before you actually get to the emergency. So everybody knows who they're contacting and what's going to be done and who does what. I mean, all the way down to like, if students were evacuated from a building, um, you're going to need food service. So an emergency command center would, um, would help facilitate that. Um, yeah, the, I guess that's the best I have 
to offer on that one also. Okay, well, I was just going to say these people that do this training, and again, I agree you want to prevent it from happening. I would think they being in this business, they would have some insight on how to prevent and, and how to do things safer. It just seems like it would be a good connection. Yeah, well, I think they would have great things to add. I guess the question is, will the rail industry respond? Um, and there are things, again, that can be done on a local level. You know, there are things we can do to prepare in, in the worst case scenario. Uh, you know, one of the other things I'm fighting for is parents. You know, we have, this is immoral. We have parents who have children in schools and they have no idea that their own children are in danger. Like at least I know, you know, and my daughter knows that if my grandchildren attend Lake Zurich High School, that is unsafe. Um, but I have the ability, because I know that, to, to move. And so does my daughter. But if you don't know that, how can that, that takes a lotus of responsibility away from the parent and they're not able to make a decision that pertains to the safety of their own child, and that should be illegal, and it's definitely immoral. Okay. I'm going to add, Joanne, I don't know if you're on mute or whatnot, but can you, I don't know how many people can actually read the chat, but can you read what you just wrote, or I can read it? Oh, but sure. I just unmuted myself. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Hi, yeah. Joanne. Hi there. Hi, Jerry. Nice job. I really um, always learn something new from the presentations. I have been very active and one of the people to stop the holding tracks that were proposed to be built in Lake Forest and in Glenview, Illinois, working closely with Glenview and their village. Um, three mile holding tracks for freight trains that would be um, basically put there, allowed to idle indefinitely um, under the federal guidelines so that um, the faster Metra trains and Amtrak trains could pass. This is all part of a proposal from um, Wisconsin and the Hiawatha Services Amtrak um, needing to expand their services, which we did not object to. It's just holding tracks were not considered environmentally safe. It was adjacent to many schools and right through a natural uh, preserve. So, um, and hospitals in Glenview, it was a very big problem. But one of the issues I see that we really should be looking at is the self-regulation of the industry that really threatens us in an industry that's primarily concerned with profits versus safety. And many of the Obama era regulations have been eliminated, uh, including the uh, pneumatic, electronic pneumatic braking systems, which were on the schedule to be implemented over a period of time. Uh, it isn't, we know that these chemicals have to be transported and people that are saying to me, well, it's safer to be on the trail, on the train tracks than on the highways may have a point. However, they're not currently being transported safely. And when profits always remain a higher priority than safety, we need to get involved. And this includes, like I suggested earlier, the environmental impacts of idling freight trains. Um, right now, they even sit for hours along these, the rail, the Metro, uh, the M Metro Milwaukee North track waiting to get into the city. These are heavily populated neighborhoods and the trains are literally there spewing carcinogenic diesel fumes into the air where children are out playing on the, on the playgrounds right next to the tracks. This is really a huge environmental impact. So um, the speed of the trains, part of the Amtrak proposal was to increase the speeds of freight trains from 40 miles per hour to 50 miles per hour on this heavy populated um, railway so that they could move faster through. And, um, and certainly we know from the derailments that the DOT 117, 117 tank cars are not safe enough um, those that have had derailments have had problems, and they may be safer than the 111s, dot 111s, but they're still not the answer to a safer, a safer transportation of hazmat chemicals. So there's a lot to be concerned about, and I think we really need to 
get engaged in a political sense because people are not aware of most of these problems. And being proactive is the only way to stop this. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I agree with everything she said. <laughs> I know that time is running short, and I just, I, I, yes, I agree, and, and, and thank you for that. And I just want to uh, uh, make sure um, single and the carriers in this current national round of bargaining are aggressively pushing for engineer only single employee crews. Uh, we, we didn't have the time to cover all the many reasons of why this is just going to increase the dangers. But uh, we don't know where this could turn into a showdown between rail labor and the carriers. And so if it does, we will need uh, as much of the public support. Uh, so, so stay tuned. Uh, go to our website. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. And, and stay tuned because uh, uh, you'll probably be hearing about this. Thank you. And Thank I you. have an action plan on um, the uh, people-b4-profit. Uh, Hyphen Profits Org, uh, the website I showed you at the beginning, there is an action plan. So there's a lot of detail of where we're at, what we can do. Um, one thing I would like to start doing is probably in the summer, um, but I need, I need support and I need to know that there would be people who would be interested in doing this also, but um, perhaps doing some rallies near schools to um, make sure well, to, in an effort to bring attention, I don't want to do it when students are in session, not that they are right now, but um, if things were normal, <laughs> which right now they are not, um, I, I don't want to disrupt the learning day or disrupt students, but, you know, or maybe somebody has a better idea, but some way to draw attention to schools that are in blast zones and um, bring attention so that parents will know that their their child could be in danger. Jerry, uh, this is Mark Lundholm again. Um, I had to, I know you cited some uh, things with, with our state and uh, national legislatures. Was I wrong in that Dan Gillespie had something to do with some legislation? Um, uh, no, and, uh, no. then, oh, sorry. So Go what, ahead. What is the state of our? Uh, uh, legislature in the state with policies or, or laws or more, um, you know, legislation to put through. And um, those are some of the things that we get involved with, that, with uh, NWSOFA. So any guidance there or, or uh, yeah. suggestions as to how we could get involved? Yeah, I am familiar with um, Senator Gillespie. She did not have, um, she may support something that I'm unaware of, but um, in terms of the, um, uh, resol resolution 982 um, that I was working on. It was uh, Senator Julie Morrison that introduced it, and you know this maybe is another. Maybe I'm mixing reason. him up. Yeah, I know Julie maybe comes there was... to our meeting sometimes too. <laughs> well, you know this is another reason why it's so important to keep a line of communication open with our elected officials, um, because I mean, who would have ever thought that you know I could just go to a senator? Well. Certainly I didn't, but you know, just go to a center and say, you know, I have this concern um, and could you do something about it? You know, it was amazing that she said yes and then did. I mean, it was that easy, um, depending on what it is you're trying to get through, of course. Um, and not only, I didn't even have to, uh, Senator Laura Murphy, I didn't even have to ask her anything. I was talking to um, one of her legislative aides and next thing I know he said, um, would you like Laura Murphy to co-sponsor? And I said, oh my gosh, you know, why didn't I ask? Of course I do. So we really need to work on keeping these lines, you know, we need to be meeting with these, our elected officials. I mean, we have to go beyond just getting them elected. We need to make sure that they're representing our interests. And many times, you know, when I first started this in 2014, uh, my first experience with an open board meeting and my, my mayor went very badly. And I had a horrible outlook on, on our elected officials. But the, through the work I've done, I've really come around to a whole new appreciation of what they do, the efforts they take, what they have to do in order to get things passed. You know, it's not enough for them to want something 
they have to have a majority vote. Um, and we as, as, as um, citizens need to do our civic responsibility and participate and, and get them voted and talk to other people in other locations and, uh, and network, networking, network, 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 which is, you know, your organization is a, a growing organization. Um, and that, that kind of a network can make things happen. So I guess I'm going to pass the torch to you, Bill um, or Christine. Actually, we're going to we're going to pass it back to Mark Lundgren uh, to kind of do a uh, an, a recap. Mark. Uh, wow, you know a lot was covered. Uh, I think a lot needs to be covered. Um, the second time I've heard this uh, amazes me as much as the first time. And, um, you know, there are certainly things that I think uh, that OFA can, can and Indivisible can, can link to some of this stuff. Uh, and um, I some, think some of our partner groups would probably like to have uh, Jerry and Mark come and present there. Um, do, do any, does anybody else have suggestions for actions uh, other than what Jerry just put out? And... Um, uh, Marcus I just want to thank everybody for their participation. Thank yeah, you Marcus all very Jim, much. Yeah, could, could you just make sure that uh, as as bills, would it be you as bills are presented uh, either in Springfield or in D.C. that we're aware of those so we can act on those? Yes, I, I will. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Thank you. Um, I, I will be posting those on um, profit, uh, peoplebeforeprofits.org. Um, currently, I, I've worked with uh, Congressman Schneider. So, you know, what Senator um, uh, Morrison got, had adopted, it was a resolution. The, the problem with resolutions is they, they have no teeth. Um, and even if we do get a bill, I'm still working on trying to get a, 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 you know, a state official to sponsor a, a bill that calls for certain protocol, uh, you know, consistent protocol to be followed in the event of an emergency. But um, I uh, have worked with um, a legislative aide, um, who, uh, uh, Brad Congressman Schneiders, uh, who works in the uh, Transportation and Infra uh, Infrastructure Committee in Washington, D.C. They are currently drafting uh, such le legislation to help protect our students at our schools. Um, I, I know what I asked for, and that, that, led, that is in my action plan on my website. I don't know what it's actually going to look like. Um, last I talked to uh, Tommy Brown, he said it was soon to be introduced, but this was before our current um, pandemic. So I'm sure that's been put on hold. I, I don't know when we'll see it introduced, but I was told that you know it should be introduced soon. So I don't know what that means given the current pandemic, but I know they've worked at it's been drafted, and they last I I know they were talking to stakeholders, which I understand to mean you know schools and emergency personnel that would be impacted by the legislation. But um, you know the the like I said in Illinois. It had a unanimous vote. I don't think anybody is going to disagree for the need to keep our students safe. It's that we need to get it in place. So I'm, I'm hoping to see that come soon. Okay. <laughs> Mark, anything? So I think uh, I, I'm done with what I need to know. Um, and I, my agenda says ask. Sarah and Bill, what other online events will be happening during this month? And um, also how to let people know how they can get involved with uh, nwsofa-indivisible. And um, thanks for everybody uh, participating tonight. And I would, again, I would just like to thank you uh, uh, for, for having us on behalf of Railroad Workers United. Thank you very much for this opportunity to just have this discussion with you. So. Uh, just, Even if we had to move it online because of <clears throat> other circumstances. Yeah. Just, just a, a few notes. <clears throat> uh, NWSOFA, uh, you can find this very easily 
by going www.nwsofa.org. And we have a very uh, nice website that is laid out by the nine issue groups that we have. Um, and uh, you'll find a photos area where we are, we capture every event. I think we had uh, 85 or 95 last year. Um, and uh, a little bit of a, of a challenge uh, taking pictures of these online events, but we're learning it. We're learning fast. Um, just a, a few notes here real, real quick. We really appreciate uh, Jerry, you and Mark and Michelle, uh, Shelly and, and Fritz is uh, coming on and being part of this. That was great. Um, Washington, D.C. <laughs> yeah. and, and we had the Joe Salvato uh, join us from Cincinnati. Joe was our original seven years ago, climate uh, lead. And uh, I can tell you, I didn't know much about the climate, climate change, et cetera, but I learned a lot from Joe. And, uh, and that has, over the seven years, that legacy has been uh, carried forth to uh, Marge, who passed away several years ago, and now Mark, <clears throat> just doing a great job by bringing new people in and new ideas which is exactly what we're about, informing our members. Um, on, the, on the call tonight, we have several people uh, with the uh, League of Women Voters. Um, I think Laura uh, has left, but Jim, I've heard you ask some questions. I believe you go down to uh, Springfield. Uh, I believe it's with the League of Women Voters um, on some legislative issues, is that correct? Yeah, I am, I am now, uh, for the state of Illinois, the uh, gun violence uh, specialist for the League of Women Voters. So Great. I do I do a lot with them at this point. And and, uh, and Jim is also a co-lead in our Restore Our Democracy. Um, I, I also want to point out that uh, uh, we have a, a rising politician among us, uh, Maggie Trevor, who uh, survived. Yeah. Uh, by a uh, 85 percent margin. Uh, what was that, Maggie? 81 to 19. <laughs> so oh, it's actually she... a 62 point margin. But <laughs> she is running for District 54. <clears throat> that is a seat held by Tom Morrison, uh, a very conservative Republican, and everybody's going to be turning out to uh, to work for her. Uh, Maggie. Do you have a comment or two you'd like to make? Uh, I think this has just been very informative. Uh, it's interesting that the uh, Union Pacific Line basically bisects the district. And so I think this is a really important issue for the district. So I learned a lot today. Thank you so much for being here. I, I've actually met you before. Oh. I am oh. wishing you the best. Thank you. <laughs> And I know your opponent, and I would definitely vote for you if I could. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> we'll all have her back. Uh, oh, know, yes. It, it, I, I will talk you up every opportunity I have. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Horan, you are the, the co-lead of this group. Uh, uh, is there anything you'd like to add tonight? Um, I would just like to let folks know this is a whole new world for us. And behind the scenes, Christine, you can see, and Bill and Jerry and Mark, I don't know how many hours they spent to get everything, to get the sound to work. Um, I think it came out tremendous. Um, those of you that are maybe kind of new to us, and uh, if you have anything that you particularly liked about how this worked, would you come back for more? If you have anything we need to tweak, we definitely appreciate your feedback. I know a couple of you, I wasn't sure who everybody is. Um, and there may be some new folks. There was, uh, let me go down the list. Uh, Tracy or... Uh, let's see. Is there a Carrie? Are you still on? 
I didn't know how you found us. <laughs> are, are you probably still hey, muted? Hey, hey, Sarah, it's Mikey. Yes. I know Carrie. Oh, okay. Okay, so anybody have any comments just on overall? Uh, is this something where we're all sitting at home doing whatever, and I think it was just so valuable to be able to have quality time to learn, to, to find out actions we need to be thinking about beyond what's going on in our, our world. So definitely um, chip in if you got something to say. Appreciate it. Yeah, hey, Sarah, this is Jim. The only problem with these is we can't go out for a beer afterwards. I, hey, hey, Jim, I got my brownies here. I mean, the last two. There's one left. We can, we can, we can, all, we can all break them out. <laughs> okay. All right. We have one, uh, one other uh, thing to talk about tonight, and I think this goes under the bonus round. Uh, look over at curtain five. We've got a bonus round here. Uh, Christine, will you give us some idea of uh, what you've been doing in the background tonight and what we're preparing? So I've been recording the bridge and um, putting faces in as they, they're available. And I should be able to get this up over the weekend uh, to our NWS OFA YouTube channel. Uh, it's actually was worked out pretty well. We got some good uh, good sound with the video, and the deck came over pretty clean. Uh, so far, the bandwidth has, has kept up very nicely. Uh, when we close the meeting, I would like to have the presenters stick around. Um, so hopefully, you're willing to take some uh, feedback, and I'll give you my observations. And at that point, I'm... I'm ready to end the recording. Just And just so you know what that means, the, the YouTube channel, you can find us on NWS OFA YouTube. Uh, Christine's been setting up in our meetings and, and taking videos, uh, uh, putting up the presentations, capturing the speakers, and capturing the audience participation. It's been very nice. So the, trying to figure out how to make this into that is is cool. Uh, but once we get that done, uh, we can start broadcasting out to not only our membership, and we have 5,000 in our, our uh, six township area, but also our Facebook accounts uh, and our Twitter accounts. We can start literally putting this online, either using uh, Facebook uh, Live or Facebook Watch or whatever. So our hope is what we experienced tonight was, as Christine likes to say, um, it, it was like a, uh, um, a, a broadcast event, but we were the audience in the room uh, and, and asking questions and et cetera. But now we'll send it out to a, like a TV audience, a much broader audience, and see how much more we can, uh, we can drive forward on that. Uh, the issue, uh, Mark is an excellent issue for our climate change. Thank you for discovering, Jerry, uh, or vice versa. I'm not quite sure how it happened, but it was great well, to I have. Think Sarah, I think Sarah found out about it and forwarded it to me last fall when they had their presentation at Deerfield. So uh, thanks, Sarah. Yeah. It was good. Knew yeah. she was a good one. Yes. Grab her. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> All right. This so, was a uh, vast improvement over last night's uh, test. So thank you. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's, why, that's why we test. You know what Christine says, thanks for all the time, uh, or Sarah said, all, all the time that was put in. I can guarantee you not only a lot of time was put on, on the NWS OFA side, but uh, uh, Jerry and Mark and, and uh, uh, Michelle, they... They just, uh, and Shelly just did a, a lot of work. Yesterday at this time, those videos didn't have sound. <laughs> and it's not an easy click of a switch <laughs> to make that sound come out. It worked perfect, folks. That's it was, all, Mark. Shelly. <laughs> and Shelly, I shouldn't say all, right. 
So really? when, when all this social distancing is over, Jim, we're going to take you up, Jim McGrath. Uh, we'll all have a beer and uh, we'll get the, the, uh, uh, the presenters team, uh, Jerry, Mark, Michelle, Shelley, uh, all together. Fritz, I understand you're not close, but we'll send you a beer. All right, folks. I'll drink to that. Here, here. <laughs> all virtual right. beer. Yeah, virtual beer. I've got to figure out how to do that. So let's uh, let's all <laughs> sign off. Uh, I'll have to stay on, I think, so that this thing still goes. But we'd like to have Jerry, uh, Mark, and uh, Michelle or Shelley uh, be on. Is that is that who you want, uh, Christine? Yeah, everyone can.